Welcome to the third season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Daryl Richard Ennis was born in the 80s and went by his middle name Rick. During his young life, his mother would marry four times. He spent his time being shuffled between housing projects and mobile home parks in Montgomery, Alabama. The Montgomery Advertiser reported that his aunt recalled her large nephew having to wear his stepsister's hand-me-downs until the pink fabric was stretched to the breaking point. By age 12, Rick towered over many of his classmates of 5 foot 9 and over 200 pounds. His brown hair was cut short and parted on the side. Below his narrow, thin lips sat a double chin. Dusty, his closest friend, said, People made fun of Rick, and it bothered him that everyone had nicer things than he did. As Rick got older, he became angry and resentful. But despite his hard life, he excelled in school and got straight A's and made the honor roll. In 1992, Rick's mother Linda, who was nicknamed Dolly, married Eddie Flowers. Eddie's children were older and did not live with the couple, but they saw another side of Rick. A young kid who stole guns from them, then threatened them. But they didn't take him seriously. After all, he was just a child. In the fall, Eddie and Dolly moved with Rick 60 miles away to Brantley. Rick was forced to leave his friends and teachers behind. Arriving in a new town, he felt isolated and all alone, living in a noisy mobile home park just off the Birmingham Highway. His mother did her best to make the new place feel homey. Perched on the couch were cushions covered in flowers and white lace doilies. Eddie found work as a tow truck driver. His co-workers named him Elvis because of his dark, bushy sideburns. Dolly was a pretty blonde in her youth and still maintained her looks although her long hair was now cut short, and it was easy to see that her son looked just like her. Eddie tried to forge a relationship with Rick and took him to work with him on the weekends. Rick sat in the passenger seat while Eddie drove the tow truck. But as hard as Eddie tried to crack open Rick's shell, he resisted. Eddie and Dolly found a nice, quiet house ten miles away in Snowden. Eddie had arranged to borrow a pickup truck to move the family on Saturday. But Rick wasn't interested in moving again and formulated a plan that he wrote down on paper. On Wednesday, March 3rd, 1993, Eddie put his plan into motion. Sometime after 4 p.m., he raised a 22 rifle, aimed it at his angelic mother's face, and pulled the trigger, then used a baseball bat to beat her. When her heart stopped beating, he placed a velvet blanket over her face and a single rose on her chest. Then Rick waited. Eddie arrived home 
and opened the door. Rick had the shotgun aimed at his face and fired. Dolly died at 40 and Eddie at 39. Rick climbed into the family car and attempted to drive away. The manager of the mobile home park heard the car's engine racing and its tires spinning in the mud. And asked Rick where his mother was. Rick replied that she was taking a shower. He managed to get the car unstuck, spun out of the driveway, and headed towards Montgomery. Over the next 30 hours, Rick drove, making periodic stops. He broke into a grocery store, then into a house and stole cigarettes and guns. Scared and alone, he called his friend Dusty and asked him to skip school because he needed someone to talk to. Forty miles from the murder scene and only two miles from his grandmother's house, Rick crashed the car into a fence on the side of the highway. Alabama State Trooper John Clark spotted Rick walking and thought it was unusual. WTVM News reported that the trooper stopped and asked Rick where his parents were. In a cold, unemotional response, Rick simply stated, I killed them. Officers arrived at the family's mobile home to find that Rick had indeed been telling the truth. Perched on Dolly's bludgeoned body, laid a single rose, and written on a piece of paper was his plan for murder. At his hearing, Rick spoke only a few words and showed no emotion as he admitted to killing his parents. In the state of Alabama, those under 14 could not be tried as adults nor could they be executed. As a juvenile, his sentence was not made public. He served his sentence at a Department of Youth Services facility. The longest sentence he could have received was nine years, as he would be released once he turned 21. After his release, Rick moved to Auburn in Alabama. Working at a bowling alley, he met Lori Slesinski, a slender and pretty 24-year-old who had moved to Auburn to attend university. Her mother was nervous about her being on her own and had purchased a mobile home and a park for her to live in. But Lori told her mom she would be fine. She had her precious little dog, Peanut, with her. The little pup didn't like the tile floor in the kitchen, so she spread out small throw rugs for him to walk on. In December 2005, the temperature had dropped, and by late afternoon, it was dark. Christmas was right around the corner, and Lori felt bad for Rick, but he was going to be alone. Although the two had become good friends, she didn't know where his family were or why he was alone. So, kind-hearted Lori took Rick home with her to her mother's for Christmas. In the summer of 2006, Lori graduated with a degree in psychology and criminology and planned to get her master's degree. She was going to be moving and asked Rick to return her house key. One day, when she wasn't home, he let himself in and left her key along with a love letter. When Lori read it, she was not happy and told Rick they were only friends. On Friday, June 9th, 
Rick phoned his co-worker Jeremy Brooks to say his car had run out of gas and asked him to bring him gas. Afterwards, he asked if he could keep the gas can, but Jeremy said no and took it with him. Rick didn't stop thinking about Lori and came up with a plan. He locked his keys in his car and asked Lori to borrow a metal coat hanger. He bent the wire into a hook and unlocked his car. Then he followed Lori back into her home. That night, Lori and her girlfriend Lindsay Braun had plans to enjoy a few drinks and watch a movie at Lindsay's. At 6.30 p.m., Lizzie phoned Lori on her home phone. As they talked, she could hear Rick's voice in the background. Lori said that she was going to pick up a few things and she'd be right over, then drove to Walmart and picked up supplies. Something in Rick snapped. Perhaps it was because Lori reminded him of his mother with a pretty smile and blonde hair. Or perhaps it was his childhood memories of living in a mobile home park. It's not known exactly what happened, but it's thought that when Lori returned, Rick viciously attacked her, sexually assaulted her, and strangled her. At 7 p.m., Lindsay phoned Lori again. The phone rang once, then stopped. Lindsay thought Lori had changed her mind, but when she didn't hear from her on Sunday, she called numerous times and left messages on her answering machine. Lori and Lindsay worked at the same local mental health facility and when Lori didn't show up for work Monday, Lindsay and her co-workers thought that was out of character for her. She called Lori again, but now the answering machine did not answer. By Tuesday, Lindsay was really worried and texted Rick to see if he'd seen Lori. He replied that he hadn't, and now he was getting worried too but he assured her that Lori was probably fine. At work, Lindsay's supervisor asked her and another co-worker to go to Lori's home and check on her. As they pulled in, Lindsay noticed Lori's car was missing and her front door was unlocked. Inside, Keenet was in his crate. She noticed it wasn't soil, and he appeared happy, but something made Lindsay uneasy. Then she spotted the answering machine. Instead of it being lit up with her messages, there were none. Someone had erased them. As they walked through the rooms looking for Lori, Lindsay noticed the throw rugs in the kitchen were gone and the garbage can outside was missing. Meanwhile, another co-worker contacted Lori's mother. Arlene immediately left work and headed to Auburn. When she arrived at Lori's home, she entered her daughter's bedroom, saw her bed was made, but noticed a long cord to her phone was gone. She immediately contacted police and reported Lori missing. Police began interviewing Lori's friends and soon learned that Rick had been at Lori's. He spun a tale that he and Lori were growing marijuana together and suggested she'd gone somewhere to sell it. But police quickly sensed that he wasn't telling the truth. Police visited Lori's mobile home and noticed scuff marks on the walls. Her bedding appeared to be shuffled 
and the temperature had been set down to freezing. And they found one earring, a gold hoop with a hair on it. The next day before dawn broke, the dark sky was ablaze in orange flames. On a deserted cul-de-sac, not far from the bowling alley where Rick worked, was Lori's Mazda. By the time the flames were doused, all that was left was a burnt-out shell. Lori's case had now shifted from a missing person to a potential homicide. Investigators determined that Lori was not in her car. Nearby on the ground, a single homemade rolled cigarette was found, and in the woods, a gas can. Police interviewed Rick a second time, and this time, they noticed multiple scratches on his arms and hands. Investigators searched Rick's car. They found a small deer skinning knife with a serrated edge, a pair of black fuzzy metal handcuffs, a large box of cleaning supplies that included bathroom cleaners, Clorox bleach, and air fresheners. Rick's roommate learned of the investigation and contacted police and turned over three rugs that Rick told him he'd been given as a gift. The three rugs were identical to the ones missing from Lori's kitchen. Rick's co-worker Jeremy discovered his gas can was missing and reported it to police. Meanwhile, police recovered the last known image of Lori recorded on a surveillance video at Walmart. Later, when Arlene returned to her daughter's home, she discovered a chunk of hair in the hallway, and in a vent, she found a broken bracelet. Rick was the prime suspect, but investigators did not have enough evidence to charge him. Rick left town, and Lori's case went cold. So cold, it languished in the cold case files for ten years, until Mark Whitaker, a special agent with a newly formed cold case unit, took a look at it. After examining the evidence, he came to the same conclusion investigators originally had, that Rick Ennis was their main suspect. He and his partner, Agent J.W. Barnes, came across a nine-year-old forensic report that identified Rick's DNA in semen found on Lori's bedsheet and also in blood found on the interior side of her door. The cigarette butt found near Lori's burned-out car was sent to the forensic lab for testing. The DNA results came back a match to Rick. The lab also found his DNA on one of the three throw rugs from Lori's kitchen. As reported by CBC News, investigators tracked Rick down to Pilot, Virginia, where he was engaged to a school librarian and working for a company building yurts. On August 6, 2018, U.S. Marshals descended on the tiny town and arrested him. When the arrest was featured on TV, it jogged the memory of Terry Booth, who'd worked with Rick and recalled a conversation where Rick said he was in love with someone, but she only wanted to be friends, and that he got rid of her by strangling her and he referred to her as trailer park trash. The pandemic delayed the trial until March 2022, 16 years after Lori was murdered. Sadly, Lori's brother, 
and father had passed away. Rick's defense argued that the cigarette butt had been planted at the scene by police and insisted Lori was a drug dealer. The prosecution laid out all the evidence, including Rick's DNA. It took the jury only two short days to find him guilty, a first-degree capital murder, burglary, and first-degree capital murder, kidnapping. Although Rick was eligible for the death penalty, Lori's mother and the district attorney agreed to take it off the table. Arlene did not want to be put through years of appeals. A judge sentenced Rick to life without parole. His lawyer has vowed to appeal. To this day, Lori's body has not been found. When Rick was found guilty, she told 48 Hours that she talked to Lori that day and told her, Justice has finally come. We've waited for this for a long time. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Russell T. Scott. He became a millionaire by 25, then lost it all and turned to a life of crime. Convicted of murder in 1924, he was sentenced to hang. His lawyer's appeals kept him from the gallows, not once, not twice, but three times. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Fastlane Studios, and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who were listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them, or not shy. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.